Um, some great presentations. I know everyone's hungry, so I'll uh, try and breeze through it as much as I can. But my talk is going to be about analytics, and it's a buzzword that I'm sure everybody's heard, and some of you may have looked into it. Um, but the key word is, is applied analytics and how you can use it to develop your players. Um, ultimately, what I'm trying to do today is break down the mental barrier that some of you may have regarding analytics. They're confusing. You know, I, I'm sure the belief is still out there that hockey is a fluid game and numbers can only tell you so much. And, and the truth of the matter is, that's exactly the case. You know, analytics are just supposed to be a useful tool that you can use to help collect information ultimately to make you better. And I think there's some confusion out there that analytics guys or numbers guys are trying to change the game into something that's a mathematical equation. And that's simply not the case. I mean, uh, Brownie might have stepped out of the room, but you know, I'm an analytics guy, quote unquote, but I think one of my greatest strengths are the parts of the game that I'm most interested in are the intangible, things like chemistry, things like identity, things like confidence. Those are all part of the game as well, and this isn't to take away from it. It's just simply a piece of a puzzle that you want to add in. Um, try to explain in layman's terms what you can do to apply them specifically at your level. Sometimes information is great. You can have info, but what are you doing with the information that you have? That's the whole purpose, is collecting it to make yourself better. And then if we can, make connections between um, any relevance to your athletes and the practical application of info. So what are analytics? Uh, the, the definition in the dictionary or you know is the discovery, interpretation, and communication of meaningful patterns in data, aka information. And I have a couple graphics up here. You guys may have seen them if you're on Twitter. I mean at the end of the day, visual representations of what data show you are great. I look at that and it might as well be Mandarin Chinese. I have no idea what that's saying. And I'm an analytics guy. So don't get caught, you see information, it's confusing, okay? Um, graphs or charts like these are great, but ultimately hockey analytics are uh, trying to quantify maybe some of the fluid nature of the game. And it's like eye test meets data. And Brownie's here, he's our GM, and he's got a team of scouts that go out and they watch Midget players. And their job is to watch with their eyes and make some type of conclusion based on what they're seeing. Right? That's the eye test. But there are ways to quantify, and I'm going to get into some of what you're seeing with your eyes and collecting information that you can use as um, part of a relevant teaching tool to your players. So why are they relevant? Okay? and how can we use information to our advantage. Belzy touched on Generation Y. That's the millennials. I'm a millennial. I come from the Generation Y. We ask why questions. We're the generation that grew up at the same time as technology. Well, one of the things that nobody's really talking about right now is Generation Z or Generation Z. And these are the athletes that you're going to be dealing with and that we're starting to deal with now at the OHL level they're the ones who were actually born in the late 1990s, some say 2000. Um, they're the I generation. They've been connected from birth, right? They don't know a world where technology didn't exist. It's a fluid part of their entire lives. So Generation Z grew up with technology. They're sophisticated. They're fast, right? But there are some differences from millennials. And analytics are relevant to this generation because they crave information. Right? Ultimately, the I generation communicate with images and videos, much like millennials. You need to show them, not just tell them. They're future focused and open minded and inquisitive. They ask questions. Right? When you log into your Twitter account and you send out a tweet, you can look at how many impressions it had, how many people clicked on your profile, how far your reach went. Was it somebody in Canada? Was it somebody in Texas? Was it somebody in China? You know, this is information that's readily available to these athletes ones that are born in the early 2000s, they're entering high school, they're entering college soon, right? They're addicted. They need to be shown visuals, data, video, any information they can get will help with the why, right? So we went from the why to the Z, but the thing is, they don't just need to know why, they need to know what, they need to know how, they need to know when, right? It's all part of information that you can give them. And analytics or information 
is a tool that you can use. The I generation, right? They want to make stuff that work for success. The study was done. Over 60%, right, of students born in 2000 or later like to take a break from technology, right? While all of us are addicted to our phones, we're constantly checking our emails and constantly checking Twitter, this generation grew up with it. it it's no different, you know, um, it's like a shopping cart. You know, it's a tangible thing that we see. We go to do groceries, we have a shopping cart. That's a part of our world. Well, the digital shopping cart is no different. It's a tangible thing, especially to this generation. They don't see a difference between the two. And there are lots of different terms that people use, but the technological world and the real world are two fluid things for these athletes. Though. So when you're looking to collect information, right, they want to disconnect. So how can you make the connection from the information you've got into a tangible, physical thing? You know, um, they want to disengage and they create something different, which is great for coaches because they're not just focused on outcomes, they're focused on the process, which is ultimately what coaching is about. It's about the process to try and create an outcome. I want to talk about process versus outcome. Wins, that's an outcome, right? It's an outcome that's dictated from a process of scoring goals. But goals are also an outcome. They're part of the process, but goals are an outcome. Well, how do you generate goals? Well, you get shot attempts. Well, shot attempts are part of the process of scoring goals, which are part of the process of winning. But shot attempts are an outcome from generating controlled zone entries. Well, zone entries are definitely part of the process, but that's an outcome from having the puck breaking out of your end, a controlled zone exit. You have to have the puck. You can't get into the zone to get a shot to score a goal unless you get out of your end. So it's all connecting the dots. Controlled zone exits are an outcome of good passes. Well, good passes are an outcome from gaining possession of the puck in the first place. But gaining possession is an outcome of having good puck recovery skills off the rebound. And then, you know, how do you create puck recoveries or lose pucks you need to have an active stick? And the cycle goes on and on and on. Because you have the puck, you get a shot, there's a rebound, you might lose it, you gotta get it back. How do you do that? It's part of the process. But these athletes today understand that, right? It's cyclical in nature, but it's all part of the process. So they want to know how they're gonna get the outcome, what to do, why they're doing it, how are you gonna show them and not tell them. This is where analytics can come in. And everyone's heard about the terms Corsi and Fenwick, and they're based around shot attempt data, that people are trying to make the connection between shot attempts and possession. And they're definitely a useful tool, right, to understand, but for me, shot attempts are an outcome. And they're probably a more general outcome as opposed to part of the process. I wanna know how do we generate shots, and how can I quantify the information what's happening on the ice and understand who's good at creating the opportunity to create shot attempts. So here's, here's a little bit of something that you might do already um, is goal setting. And as a, analytics can relate to player development. You might ask a defenseman who is a bantam single A player, what are your three goals for the year? I want to score 20 points, outcome. I want to be a plus player, outcome. I want to make triple A next season. Outcome. That's great. Okay? You're the coach. Your job is to focus on the process. How can I help you achieve those goals? Well, you need to improve your passing, better gap control. Those are processes, yes, that will help, right? And it explains how you're going to accomplish those outcomes, but it doesn't explain why. And it doesn't explain how you're going to do those things because ultimately, Better passing and better gap control are outcomes of the process, right? So how are we going to understand how? There's the eye test, and you've got your coaching, and Ben did a great job with his video on the last one showing gap control and forcing dumps. And instinctively, you're all good hockey people. You can watch the game, and you can understand that a guy had good gap, right? But there's some biases in that. And you could watch a player, and there might be... 12 opportunities during a game where the offense was coming in on attack and defensive. And two out of those 12 times, he might have had a big hit. And you're a guy who likes hitting. So you stick out in your mind, wow, that guy had great gap control that game because 
I remember two times where he blew up a guy right at the blue line and forced a dump. Well, the other 10 times, he might have allowed a controlled zone entry, and the other team got a shot on goal. But your bias, as a hockey person who saw those things, and it's relevant, right? you remember what you wanted to see. But what you don't remember, or maybe you failed to see in the first place, was what happened on the 10 of the 12 entries where he allows a guy to carry the puck into the offensive zone, generate a shot on goal, or create a scoring chance against. Okay? So, how do you want to improve your passing? That's part of the process. Well, maybe you want to track zone exits. Well, what's a zone exit? It's a breakout opportunity. Right? So, a controlled zone exit means your team is maintaining possession of the puck from your zone into the neutral zone. And that is ultimately going to lead to possession in the neutral zone, which is going to allow you to create carry entries, which will help you get assists. If you wanted to get 20 points, well, it starts at your end by getting a zone exit. Gap control, right? Same thing. You want to break up more plays off the rush, leading to change of possession in your favor, you're going to be a plus player. Well, maybe you want to track zone denials. Every single time the other team has the puck and they're carrying it up your side of the ice, What's the outcome of what happened? Did you force a dump? Did you uh, allow a carry entry? Did the other team get a shot on goal? That's information that can be tracked. And I'm not saying on the bench that you stand there with a clipboard, but you want to engage. Maybe parents are always asking, I know, I coach minor hockey, what are you doing to develop my kid? You know, Well, what are you doing to help me develop your kid? Are you supporting? Engage them. So come up with some way that you're going to quantify these things and have them track it. So I've got a little bit of video I want to show you. And the first one is going to be on, uh, on gap control. Same thing, and I don't need to explain why because Ben already did a great job of explaining why it's important. Okay, here's another one: controlled entry, defenseman blocked the shot, so there wasn't a shot attempt. At the end of seven games, okay, you might have some meaningful data now on which defenseman is the best at defending the rush, and you can get rid of some of your biases as a coach because you, you're a guy who likes hitting, okay, and you think that you've witnessed something, but really the dad is telling a different story. <coughs> Maybe you've got that kid on your team who isn't the best looking skater, who, you know, is, is unassuming, but, and, and I can think of a guy specifically that's on the St. Catharines Falcons, his name is James Guest, and he's one of my favorite players I've ever coached, okay? He'll drive you crazy when you watch him because he looks like Bambi on the ice. He gets out there, his skates are going one way, his stick's going another way. 
Rick calls him an off-kilter washing machine, okay? Because that's what he looks like, Great kid. okay? But if you look at the data after the game on a controlled zone exit, the guy's off the charts. Every time he gets the puck, he makes the first pass and we get out of the zone, right? And he's a plus player, he generates points, he doesn't look good, but the data says something different, right? So when you want to apply it to goal setting, we'll go back, okay? 20 points, be a plus player, make triple next season. Well, it's all part of the process. You want to improve your passing. Well, now let's collect some data that's quantifying your passing. Right? Every time you have the puck, you're having to make a play. Was it a positive play? Was it a negative play? Track it over time. Maybe you have more positives than negatives. Right? It's a, it's a good way to understand possession and how it correlates to success. Right? And now you're engaging families. You're engaging the parents. You're understanding, okay, well, now we're doing a bunch of passing drills in practice. Why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it so we can generate more controlled zone exits, so we can have more possession of the puck, so we can generate more chances for our team, right? And now you can monitor improvement. At the start of the year, maybe a guy, three out of 12 times he's making a breakout pass, he's giving it to the other team. But now you can apply it to your drills, and they're asking why, 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 how, how, how. At the end, when you're doing breakout drills, right, we're working on passing because you want to generate more controlled zone exits. It's going to make you a better player. That resonates with the player a whole lot more than let's just work on breakouts. Right? So it's connecting the dots, why we're doing it, and now you've got data to supplement some of the communication. And it doesn't mean you have to do it all the time. You don't just you know, throw data in your player's faces with no context. They want to know why you're working on certain things. They want to know, you know parts of the reason why your practice is built. They're engaged. They're asking questions. Well, now you can engage their parents, you're focusing on development, and you have information to help you, right? So, some advice that I just got, right? Every player is different, and there's different ways you can quantify it. I gave you a couple of examples, tracking zone exit, zone denials. Well, maybe on the flip side for a forward, you want to can, uh, track his zone entries, right? How many times did he have the puck in the neutral zone and dump it in, as opposed to carrying it over the blue line? Right? It's, it's a simple little thing that their parents can just write a check mark, but then you can tell them at the end of the game, well, you know, you had possession of the puck in the neutral <coughs> zone 15 times and you dumped it in 10 when you could have carried it in, right? And some of you don't have the video to go back and show examples, so the data's not going to lie. I mean, if I'm a player and you're throwing in my face, I need to do a better job of managing the puck or I need to control the puck better, and I'm working on possession drills and practice and puck protection. Well, I'm doing it because in the game, I'm dumping it in every time I've got it. And that's information, right? And it's not confusing, and it's not breaking the, the game down into formulas, right? It's information that you've got based on what they've done that you can apply into the game, right? Uh, every team is different. And Dalsy talked about identity and building your practice. Maybe you're a possession team and you're a speed team. So all your drills that you're doing that day are focused on generating speed out of your zone. Well, for the Ottawa Senators, they were a conference final team this year. You know, their 1-3-1 one, one was what they were notorious for. I'm willing to bet that one of the things that they might have been tracking was how many times they could force dumps at center as opposed to at the blue line, right? Or a team like Pittsburgh, that's a pace team that's in your face, they might be more focused on zone entries. Figure out what's important to you, right, and to your team, and then figure out a way to quantify it. Instead of just making a decision well, I think we did a good job of that. You're probably right. And if your data tells you you're wrong, there's one of two things happening. Either your data and your collection isn't right, or your assumptions are wrong, right? You want the two to match. You don't want a bunch of data that's saying something totally different than what you believe. You want it to confirm your beliefs, and if it's something different, then you need to reevaluate part of your process. Right? So decide what's important to you and your team and figure out a way to quantify it and actively use it to measure improvement and progress. Focus on process-based initiatives. Right? Focusing on the outcome is only going to make you lose sight of what's important to get the results you want. And it doesn't just mean in the sense of development in your team. I look at myself you know, as a hockey coach. I coached minor midget AAA in 2012. Our team won 12 games. We were terrible. We were the second worst team in the SCTA. Okay? The next year, I coached major midget AAA. We were a 500 team, probably fourth in the SCTA. 
I got an opportunity to coach Junior B in Pelham. We were literally the worst Junior B team in Canada. The worst team in Canada. I was 16 games, this is two years ago, 16 games, three now. 16 games in my Junior B coaching career, we were 0 and 16. 0 and 16. But the process was important to me. And I felt like every day we were getting better. I was doing my job to get better as a coach, going to seminars, you know, looking online, reading books every single day, talking to coaches like Frank and Rick and Dan Timmons. It was about the process, not the outcome. And I felt, even at that time, we were going to get better. The outcome will take care of itself. Focus on the process. Be a good person. Learn. Do things the right way. Outcomes will eventually come your way. I got fired. We were 1 in 16. I finally won a game as a coach, and then I got fired. Okay? That day, it just so happened I had some good conversation with the Gurneys, and uh, I texted Frank the night before I was supposed to meet with the old team and said, hey, I think I'm a dead man walking. Can we talk in the morning? He said, absolutely. I got fired at Tim Hortons. I called him from the parking lot, and Frank said, practice is at 4 o'clock. They got hired as an assistant coach by the first place team. One of the last place teams, the head coach, got fired and got hired by you know, the first place team the same day. Well, that summer, Frank decided he wanted to take a step back from coaching. I go from the assistant coach to the head coach and assistant GM of the St. Catharines Falcons, perennial top team in junior B. You know, we have a good year. We lose the finals to Caledonia. That summer, opportunity comes up where Erie Otters are hiring an assistant coach. And my name gets thrown in the hat. I have some good interviews with Brownie and Chris Knobloch, the head coach, and I get hired. And all of a sudden, in a span of four years, I go from the head coach of the second worst AAA team in Ontario to being the assistant coach on the best team in Canada at the major junior level. And it wasn't because the whole time I was focusing on the outcome. Of course, you know, you've got goals and you want to set yourself some objectives to help you have a vision of where you want to go. But focus on the process. How are you going to get the outcome you want? And if you don't focus on those things, then you're going to lose sight of so much important stuff along the way. And if you focus on the outcome, you're not going to get the outcome that you want. Um, actively engage parents and players. And that's really the most important thing, I think, that you want to do. You're collecting information, you're doing all this, but it's how you're going to make your players better. And this generation of athlete is a lot different than the generation that we're currently in right now. If they're coming into our league, we've got to be ready. Right? My generation, I know we wanted nothing to do with our parents. I wanted to distance myself as much as I could. I wanted to look at my phone. I wanted to be on the computer, live in a digital world where I didn't have to deal with that. This generation of athletes use their parents as friends. They're actively engaged. Everyone's heard about helicopter parenting and parents that are over and all. Well, what it's done is it's created this bond between players and parents. They view them as friends. They involve them in all their decisions. Right? They're involved. So how do you embrace that? I know I've been guilty of it at times where you want to create that divide and put a wedge between parents and players because they're yours now. You're the coach, you want them listening to your voice. Well, it doesn't work that way, right? And you're gonna find yourself really unhappy, taking phone calls and probably getting fired from a volunteer role, which sounds stupid, right? You've got the right intentions and the right vision in mind, but if you try and create a wedge, it's not gonna go your way. You have to involve them. So involve them in collecting information, involve them in the process, involve them in collecting the data, and then they can actually see what you're doing for them and what they're gonna be able to do for their players or their sons or their daughters. Um, and it'll help you know, develop your players, your people, and your team, and it's gonna make you a better coach. So um, that's really all I've got. And if you have any questions about any of this stuff, or I didn't really dive too much into analytics and specific information that you can gather, but it's just a little bit of a guide that you can do to start embracing and integrating the information collection process that you're approaching today. So again, if you have questions, I think everyone's got my email through um, some of the correspondence that we've had, but I know you're hungry now, I know I'm hungry, so let's go have some lunch.